Welcome to the Better Questions podcast. This is episode number three, and today we're asking, can Christians consume R-rated content? And this episode, we went a little bit looser with the format. Uh, It wasn't as pre-planned out as previous episodes, so this episode's more of a conversation amongst three friends, so I hope you view it accordingly. Uh, We're really pleased so far with the traction and attention this podcast has gotten. Uh, We want to thank all of you who have listened to every episode so far. And we just ask if you are enjoying this podcast and you enjoy an episode, along with subscribing, please rate and leave a review for our podcast. That way we can get more traction on all of the various websites. And also just share these episodes on social media. Uh, The website is betterquestionspodcast.com. Just share it and get the word out there because we really are happy with Uh, the things we're doing on this podcast, trying to bring unity through questions. And so I hope you enjoy this episode of the Better Questions podcast. If I had a dollar in Bible college for every time someone stopped me from talking about a movie and just looked at me with this snooty tone and said, I don't watch those movies. I would be a very, very rich man. Yeah, I've definitely also been part of conversations that take that turn like to towards the awkward. You know what I mean? Like you just mentioned, you know, casually the Wolf of Wall Street and then everybody's like, (sighs) Like you just like punched a baby. <laughs> yeah. Like I just, yeah, but you grandma. know why, you know why they're all like that? It's because they've all seen it. They just don't <laughs> want to admit it. Otherwise, yeah. how else would they know to be shocked? How That's do true. you know? Yeah. I, I, well today we're asking, can Christians consume R rated content? But I think the real question, what that really means is can Christians watch Game of Thrones? That's what that's what people really mean by this question. It's like they people just want to feel everyone wants to watch Game of Thrones, you know? Everyone wants to. But people want that outside objective validation, you know? And so you get people like like, "Oh, oh, oh, you, you, you hear someone talking about Game of Thrones and they have to clarify, I read the books. I read the books." <laughs> it's like they can't admit that they also watch the show. So that's the heart of the question today. You know, I think there is a fine line that every person, and particularly Christians, find themselves wrestling with. It's like, am I sinning Mm -hmm. by watching sin take place? Right. And there's a lot of people out there, I think, that may not believe that they're sinning by watching or reading certain things, but they would just say, why subject yourself to that kind of content for right. fun or for entertainment. Right. I, a valid question. Yeah, I think a good way to get started is just, let's just outline some of the various opinions about consuming R-rated content, and maybe this will get us going, because when I list these, I can picture one or two people kind of in each camp, and I don't think these are exhaustive lists. I think there's probably lots of opinions, but these are just the three I came up with. So I think the three opinions about consuming R-rated content are, first, I think some people hold Christians should only watch slash read, consume, whatever, Christian material, meaning material that is focused solely on Christ. So like people who won't watch or read or listen to anything that's not labeled Christian, right? Uh, And I think there's another group that would say, well, Christians can engage with non-Christian products as long as they glorify Christ when doing so. You know, like the, like whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I think there are people who don't necessarily um, worry about what they're consuming as long as what they're consuming, they can somehow glorify Christ that way, or I don't know exactly how that looks like. And then I guess there's the camp, whoever broadly would say, Christians can watch anything as long as it doesn't lead them to sin or lead like a brother or sister in Christ to sin. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. I think with this, like I'm struggling to even know 
um, how to approach the conversation because like, um, being honest, like I think all three of us probably fall into a camp that is more okay with Mm -hmm. consuming R rated content. Um, and so I want to make sure we do justice to the other viewpoints. Yeah. Let me, let me start like this, Chris, do you think there should be a standard for what Christians watch? Because this question, can Christians consume our rated content, assumes there's some standard and you're either trying to, you know, be within it or maybe you find yourself outside of the walls of this set parameters. Do you, do you think there even should be parameters? Yes. However, I, I do think it's really hard with this question to set a one size fits all parameter on it. Like it, it almost becomes completely individualistic in my mind because what, what might cause one person to struggle may not for another. So it's really hard to just say, this is the standard for everyone. Right. And I agree but I, I've still in my life come across like, even if it's not necessarily myself, but like watching someone else judge someone for the sorts of books or TV they consume or, or podcasts they listen to or music they have in the car. I, I, th- I think most people would agree there is no set parameters, but it's almost like everyone functions like there is, you know? And I don't, I don't know what to do with that. And I have my own personal parameters. And then there's the tension of like, well, I'm convinced of this, but do I hold someone else to the same parameters if I'm really convinced this is what's right? And there's like that tension of what do I do with someone if I feel like they're being too cautious or maybe they're being too liberal? And I I, I think that's the heart of this question. Let me ask this question. Because maybe it'll help us uh, trying to move forward. What what are the motivators there? Like w- when it comes to any sort of rated R or explicit comment or uh, content, why do we care? Why why would anyone not just be totally down with saying, "Yeah, let's just throw it all out and never engage with any of it"? Like if you said, "No, I really." I really want to watch this show or this movie or read this book. I don't like that. You're telling me I shouldn't. Why don't you like that? Why do you really want to engage with it? Like you're asking for what's the thing behind the thing behind the thing of this question. Like what is the heart of this question? Like why should or shouldn't you watch stuff? Yeah, that's tough. And I, I guess I could only answer for me. Like this is one of those questions that, um, maybe we're jumping the gun a little bit, but I think it it really is a personal decision point. Mm -hmm. Um, And that may actually be why a lot of people are uncomfortable with it because for a lot of things in the Bible, um, they're black and white, so to speak, or at least people view them that way. Um, Murder is wrong. And lying is bad. And it's like, these are, there's a list of sins You should not do them. Um, But I think this one falls in a little bit of a more gray area, like that's up to the individual to be able to discern whether or not the content that they're consuming is causing them to to stumble or to think certain thoughts or to lead them to sin. And so to answer your question, Chris, I think um, for me at least... When I'm watching a movie or reading a novel or reading a graphic novel for that matter, my intention of watching that content or reading it is not just purely for entertainment. For some people it is, but for me, I'm analyzing it. I'm gleaning truths out of it. I'm looking for um, symbolism. And, And really what this comes down to for me is storytelling, right? And uh, human beings, for whatever reason, are just captivated by stories. 
And you can even see that our God made us that way and knows that and utilized stories himself. Jesus told parables as a primary way to teach. And so when I'm watching a movie, even an R-rated movie, I'm looking for what is this writer or director trying to get me to see? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a commentary on our society right now, or it's a cautionary tale, or it's an uplifting, hopeful message, I'm looking for what did this filmmaker want me to feel or to understand or to learn from this piece of content? And sometimes to show how dark or how low or how awful something is, they have to use graphic content. Mm -hmm. But then that then, if you're doing a story of growth, can show how much better or how much stronger or at the end of a journey, how much somebody has learned by then showing the contrast. Right. Uh, may I push back on something? Of course. Every single thing you just said sounded to me like entertainment. It just sounds like you are entertained in a very different way than other people. Right. But then the question is, is entertainment inherently wrong or bad or dirty or filthy? And I think that goes to what's behind this question. And the reason this question even gets brought up, I think, in Christian circles is people don't want to do something wrong. And so they want to know what is the boundary between right and wrong? And does this show, book, podcast, song go past the boundary or is it within it? And so some people would, would say, well, entertainment for the most part is just wrong. You know, like you need to do something a little bit more respectable. You need to do something productive. But then there's the other side of it. Like, well, what if you are doing something productive and respectable that's also entertaining? And, you know, like it seems like when God created the universe and you look at Genesis, there's almost this sense of enjoyment, you know, like it was good. It was good. Adam and Eve were in the fields. They were, you know, taking in everything. So, again, there's this tension. But I think the heart of it is what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And and to answer the direct pushback, like I think on some level, you're right that I am entertained in a different way. But I think that the difference is, and I'm not trying to say I don't just sit down and watch like a Marvel movie and just let my brain check out every once in a while. But for the most part, when I'm watching movies or reading books, um, I am intellectually engaging. And the difference is if I'm just being entertained, like with a check my brain at the door kind of thing, then afterwards, there's no redemptive quality to what I just watched. Um, but the way that, you know, you called it entertainment, the way that I engage on an intellectual level, I can leave the cinema and still be thinking about the themes or the, me the message or the, um, symbolism of the work and then let it do something in me. Maybe go towards motivating me to change my behavior for the better. Or um, it just works in me to want to be a better person or a more compassionate person towards people that are like a, a character that I saw in the movie that I've never really, you know, that I've normally dismissed. But now I see them in a new light right. through this film. So it sounds to me like you're saying we're not allowed to do anything unless it's redemptive. Again, I, I, I said that sometimes I do, you know, check out my brain in a movie but for i'm saying for me um that's my with this issue kind of moral compass of like everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial right that's scripture and for me the line is more well was it beneficial and if so then it was permissible So it sounds to me, and I'd be curious, Andrew, maybe to hear your perspective on this, that at least one of the conflicts we're running up against in this conversation would be, it, like, is it okay to engage with something that doesn't 
have redemptive value that's just purely for entertainment value? And if so, it, is there a point where we're being entertained by things that shouldn't be entertaining us? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there are a lot of facets to this question. So I think there's the underlying, you know, like, is this morally wrong to watch? But then I think there's what you just asked me, which is like, if your sole purpose is just entertainment for the sake of entertainment, is there something wrong about that? And I think that's definitely something worth questioning. And I, I for sure have encountered people in my life who have told me to my face that you can't consume something just for entertainment's sake and you know i would never invite that person to a party (laughs) you know but that doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong um right what i would say maybe to clarify my question for you a bit uh dan said earlier like is is it wrong is it a sin to watch someone else sin Mm. And, and i guess my question is is there a difference between viewing someone else sin versus being entertained by someone right. else sinning. Yeah, I guess that would come back to how you would define entertainment in that specific instance. So if you painted a scenario for me in which you're watching, I don't know, The Sopranos. I've actually never seen The Sopranos, but it just came to mind. It, you know, there's a bunch of mobsters. I'm sure there's a lot of murder. And I think if you were watching that show and you saw someone gets shot in the head and you were like, yeah, I think I would turn to you and go like, you may want to get that checked out. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like it doesn't seem like the most healthy thing, but at the same time, uh, I think there is a sort of entertainment like that's just purely like mental stimulation. You know, it's making you think it's making you process. It's, it's making you, uh, experience an emotion. And I think entertainment in that sense isn't wrong because it happens every second of almost every day, right? Your mind is being stimulated. And I think if you're watching content that has some content in it that you yourself would not do in person, I would not say that viewing that is wrong. I would say one, how it affects you could then be wrong. Like if you take immense joy out of watching someone die on TV, There may be something there, but if it just makes you start thinking or it makes you feel an emotion, like it makes you feel sad or empathetic, or it makes you question, why would someone even kill someone? What, what makes them, uh, process that? Like watching the show Mindhunters on Netflix. That's what I liked about that show was it made me get inside the mind of someone who is, you know, like struggling with the, with mental problems. And it made me empathetic and go like, wow, like what kind of stuff is inside me? And I think that sort of entertainment has some beneficial qualities to it. Yeah. And I think what we're rubbing up against is this, is we're talking about art and we're talking about the purpose of art. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's funny sometimes that like some Christians will say, Oh, you watched that movie. And they'll talk about some R rated action movie that has the F bomb several times and like bloody violence. But then they'll take their kids to see the new Avengers movie. And I'm like, well, in the Avengers movie, they're not showing blood, Mm -hmm. but they're like destroying skyscrapers in the middle of the afternoon. You know, they just killed like a thousand people. Right. In that amazing, like CGI. There's a there's a Norse god in the Avengers. Um, (laughs) uh, That's paganism idolatry. Right. But it's and it also will have at least one f bomb and some like quote unquote lesser um, language because it's PG thirteen, which we can get into the arbitrary nature of the MPAA rating system as well. But what I want to get into is though. I would love to get into that. Yeah. Like the next 45 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to save that for two hours down the podcast. But like, I think we're talking about the function of art right now and, um, not even just film or TV or writing, but even, uh, if you look at painting and sculpture, um, there are sculptures and paintings that contain nudity that are regarded as some of the greatest works of art in history. And in fact, were done by Christian artists. Mm -hmm. And um, they're meant to evoke 
a sense of purity, actually, or beauty uh, at the human form. And it's, you know, just a, it's the nature of our brokenness that can take that and twist it. Yeah. But you look at an art form like film or, or writing, and again, sometimes you have to use the color black, you know, as you're painting a picture. You have to show darkness sometimes to, mm-hmm. for the light to shine through as bright as you want it to. And stories and art inherently move us as human beings. And so sometimes the way it moves us is by something, like I said earlier, that's beneficial, that will teach us something, that's redemptive. But sometimes the way it moves us is through humor or through something that might seem frivolous. But it makes us laugh and it makes us forget our problems for a second. And I think that psychologically that's actually healthy to be able to... to it almost escape this world for two hours to, you know, get to know these characters and even just laugh and have a good time and enjoy it. Because then what, what happens a lot of times you're talking about it with your friends, it's fostering community. And so even though, you know, you could spin it that it wasn't beneficial or constructive, but actually I think all movies are in a way or can be, if that makes sense. Okay. Then that makes me want to ask, Another question. I feel like we're getting grilled by Chris. Yeah. And I think these two separate paths we're on will converge in the end. Okay. So what makes art Christian? Like we talked earlier about, well, people say you should only watch Christian movies or read Christian books. What what makes something Christian? Like, is there a person that we have all nominated that sits there and decides like this is christian this is not christian is it the person who created it has to have been baptized like how what does that even mean i've actually when i was driving here i was actually thinking about that very question and i don't necessarily believe this but i got i tried to get inside the mind of someone who would believe this and i think this is what they would say christian art so movies music such and such whatever i think they would define it as one, anything produced or created by someone who is a professing Christian and the art, so the movie, the painting, the music is explicitly talking about Christ or a Christian theme. I think that's how someone would define Christian art. But then I would question like, is that even a genre or a adjective we should put on something? Well, and and here's what it makes me ask also. So if really we're just basing it on, well, the person who created it is a professing Christian, which I feel like a lot of times that's the main one that people go with. So does that mean if a person who is a professing, professing Christian makes a piece of art that actually says or communicates something that's not Christian, then what is it? And what if a person who's an atheist produces art that actually communicates something that is Christian, then what is it? See, that's a point I would like to raise because I've watched a fair share of, and I'm doing air quotes, Christian movies. Okay. So movies that are like clearly talking about a Christian theme or Christian idea. And the reality of my life is I've watched other movies that weren't made by Christians with, without any clear like purpose of promoting Christianity that have Christian themes, themes within those movies that actually have affected me on a much deeper level than any of the quote unquote Christian movies have. So just to mention one, Steven Spielberg's Amistad. It's one of his lesser known movies. Okay. Look it up. It was on Netflix for a while. That movie is made by a Jewish man. Okay. And it has one of the clearest, most beautiful depictions of like freedom through Christ that I've ever seen in a movie. Like the whole movie is about like freedom and being set free. And there's a lot of Christian imagery in the film. And it's like, but is it, but is it Christian? And, and when I watched it, me subjectively, 
I thought a lot about Christ and my freedom in Christ. And if the movie could do that, even if that wasn't necessarily Spielberg's intention, is that not good? Right. It, to me, the phrase I like to say is, all truth is God's truth. And, you know, no matter who stumbles upon communicating it, if, they, if an atheist stumbles upon God's truth and communicates it, it's still God's truth, right? Right. And so, like, take my favorite band of all time, which is Pearl Jam, which may reveal something about me. I just lost us a few listeners by saying that. Even flu. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But they have a, a song called Light Years. And my favorite lyrics in that song say, um, Your light reflected now, reflected from afar. We were but stones, and your light made us stars. And when I hear that, that thinks that... There you go. When I hear that, it makes me think of what we're called to do. And there's a, even a scriptural mandate is like reflecting this light that comes from Christ, that we ourselves are not a light source like the moon, but yet we can become bright as stars by reflecting the light of Christ. Eddie Vedder is not a Christian. He may be spiritual in his own way, but he was tapping into something that when I listen to that song, I believe when I sing along, it's worship because I know what I mean when I'm singing his words. Right. And that makes me think of Paul at Mars Hill, right? I mean, exactly. This is the opposite scenario, but a, a man proclaiming Christ, but he's adapting to the language of his audience, citing he never ever in that sermon on Mars Hill quotes from the Bible. He quotes from, you know, like their own common knowledge and their own poets, but he doesn't he doesn't go well in the book of Amos in chapter three, you know, and, and I, I think it goes both ways. I think Christians can use non-biblical language to reach non-biblical people and non-biblical people can use their own history ideas that somehow connect to a Christian idea and a Christian can get a lot out of it. And from my own experience, which is all I can share, I found that to be true. So maybe what I'm hearing is not that it's wrong to say Christians should only interact with Christian art or Christian media, but that what we mean when we say Christian art or Christian media is maybe very different than what has been meant in the past or should be different than what has been meant in the past. Yeah. What if, what if Christian art, only happens once it hits your eardrum or hits your retina. You know what I'm saying? Like, instead of it being, this thing was made purposefully with Christian themes, thus it's Christian art. What if it's, it's Christian art because when I digested it, it made me reflect on Christ. Or, or it communicated truth. Yeah, or it communicated truth. Yeah, like to, the easiest way, I think, to think about it is with Christian music, for a long time I've had trouble with that phrase because the music itself is not Christian or non-Christian. Like music is is a medium of notes that are made up of frequencies and I don't putting know. them together. The key of G is the most holy key, Dan. <laughs> well, Apparently. Even, and you can uh, transpose that holiness to other keys by using a capo. Yeah. Yes. Actually, the chords G, C, E minor, D are the most holy. Right. But see, the music itself uh, is neither Christian or non-Christian. It's the words that the, the writer is putting to it. And so um, you can think, if you can translate that to other mediums, like the medium itself is just a tool. Mm -hmm. It's the meaning that not only the creator puts into it, but the beauty of art is that then the listener or the, the consumer of the art can find their own meaning in yep. it. Um, whether or not it was the intended meaning, I think is irrelevant. I have, I have a question I want to throw out there. Please. Uh, this is something I've started to think about in recent years, and it's really helped me with this topic. So in case you don't know, Jesus was a storyteller, which is kind of cool. Like someone as myself who wants to be a storyteller, it's like, whoa, Jesus himself was a storyteller. Now let me ask you this. Were Jesus's stories... Christian. Of course, because Christ said them. Right. But 
how many of Jesus' stories, his parables, were explicitly about Christian people or even godly people? How many of his characters were, were people who went to the synagogue? How many of his parables uh, ended with a nice, clean ending that made everyone happy? N- no, most of his parables, the characters were everyday people who probably didn't go to synagogue, who probably hadn't been making offerings. Some of them end very dark, you know, and some of them are violent, like the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's violence in that story. Right. And that that's a great point you raise. And I'm glad you did, because here's what we haven't done in this episode yet is really given any structure. And I, I think we've done that on purpose. But I want to give just a little bit here and to say that here's why I think this question is unhelpful. Mm hmm. And that's the Bible itself is R-rated. I mean, if you really look at it, especially the Old Testament and certain passages, if you really understand, like sometimes our English translation kind of like smooths over, but as soon as you like get out a commentary and you're reading about some of these things, like in the original language, there is some R-rated stuff going down in the Old Testament. Right. And we, if we're going to talk about this question, we kind of have to reconcile that. Yeah. Like if we won't, for instance, if we won't watch um, like uh, Hacksaw Ridge because it's so uber violent depicting war, um, but yet we'll read any of the wars in the book of Joshua and it talks about like killing all of the women and children of a certain uh, place. It's like, what? Wait, who was the guy who like stabbed the king while he was like pooping? Yeah, that was uh, Ehud. Ehud, the left-handed guy. Yeah, it's like... What? Exactly. Exactly. If you, if you filmed that scene, ee, that right. would that would not be in war room. Right. If they made the Bible a movie, it would be rated R. Well, they made it a TV series, and it wasn't R, and it was kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. But well, no, I think. And yeah. You go ahead. The part of the reason the Bible is rated R is because it reflects life and the human condition and. Mm. Like life is rated R, world is rated R. And so in any sort of art form that's going to speak truth about the reality of our world or the human condition and speak any truth into that, how, how do you be honest about that without reflecting some things that may be graphic? I kind of want to take us down like a small detour, but I think this is an important question. Uh, Good, because I had a small detour. I want to take us down too. Well, maybe it's the same one. Maybe. Okay, so reflecting on the fact that uh, the Bible, if you put an MPAA rating on it, it'd probably be R. Uh, With that in mind, and this idea that Dan mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, you know, there were a lot of early Christians who were artists. You know, like Christianity has a rich history of art. So I want to ask the question, what happened? Like how, where did we get, where, where did we go wrong to where, maybe we didn't go wrong. Maybe I'm assuming that this is wrong. But how did we go from, if you look back at the Renaissance or even earlier history, like a lot of great art, a lot of great science, for instance, was made by people who would profess to be Christian. And some of the art was explicitly Christian themed. Some of it wasn't. And what happened? Just just a side note, if you look at the history of cinema itself, what you, what you realize is some of the first people to adopt film as a medium was the church. Some of the very first sh- like showings and presentations of movies were held at churches. Some of the earliest films ever made were Christian films. And if you look at the history of cinema and you kind of put it on a graph, and you plotted its quote-unquote Christianity, there's this huge chunk at the beginning, and then it totally goes away until we get to here. Yeah, so maybe maybe to make sure I understand you, it sounds like you're asking, how, how did the church and Christians go from spearheading and being the most innovative with art to just being like, a fringe subculture and not just a fringe subculture of art 
So I'm glad we're talking about this because this is actually a giant pet peeve of mine mm-hmm. is that the church has now almost laugh- laughably become copiers yes. of secular movies and content. When I was at a Redbox one time and saw the movie Sunday School Musical. Dude, I've seen that movie. It is I, Andrew and I have watched that movie with our students before. It's great in all the wrong ways. See, I about lost it. Now, nothing against anybody out there that like loves that movie and like that's your jam. But for me, it's like, why did we have to copy something that's so blatantly high school musical? Now, it makes me just as mad when I see like the Walking Dead zombie killer. It's clearly a spoof movie of The Walking Dead. It's like you're just a, a C level movie trying to piggyback off right. of some other things. Want success. me? Want me to make a worse? Right. Thing? There wasn't someone that th- that received some sort of inspiration and then chose to create innovative art. They just looked at something else and said, "Well, how right. can I take that? I'm going to make, make it kind of Christian." Sunday School Musical. Chris, you might remember this. We looked up who made that movie. Who, who produced Sunday School Musical was a horror production, production company. And if you look at their credits, they are not Christian. So what happened was this horror production company went, how can we make easy money? Oh, let's make something, quote unquote, Christian for this huge Christian audience that feels like they can only watch certain things. And so a lot of Christians are being fooled and they're being played and they don't even realize it. And, and, a lot of Christian bands aren't Christian. They're going for the demographic. And you know why they're so easily fooled? Because they're not doing what we're talking about, where you critically examine something to see if it speaks truth. They're just saying, oh, it says Christian on it. That means that's what I should engage with. There you go. Mike. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing for me. I wish, it's been a, like a lifelong wish that the church would once again reclaim that spot of of spearheading art in culture instead of copying. And I actually think that in some ways we are slowly getting there. Um, like if if you're following what Hillsong and Hillsong United is doing right now, like in some ways some might say they're following, but I really think they are doing some innovative They got stuff. nominated for a Grammy. Right. Like... <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. So I think there is hope out there. And, and uh, I think that we can just continue, if we are shedding light on this conversation, to help push Christian artists to not get so hung up on the Christian side mm-hmm. of it and focus on the artist side of it. Be unique. Be uh, innovative. Mm-hmm. Be your voice that God gave you. And make great art, man. One more thing before we or move woman. on. <laughs> or woman. One more, th- one more thing before we move on. The, the irony of this whole situation for me is we have a group of evangelicals who, in their name, evangelism, which is good news, spreading the good news, they're all about proclaiming the good news of Christ. But when it comes to the music and media they watch, it's all about we're going to hide away from the rest of the world and live in this bubble, and we're going to make things only for us. How can you be evangelical or missions-oriented if when it comes to art, you're in an echo chamber? Why not make art that can describe and proclaim the good news of Christ in a way that the rest of the world can experience it but we only make movies for ourselves and we just preach to the choir in an echo chamber. Well, and then you know what happens too. the, the few that actually start doing that and they start producing incredible art that is inspired and the world starts noticing and starts paying attention. Oh yeah. Then they get labeled as sellouts as whatever it becomes. It becomes, oh, well, none of the Switchfoot songs say Jesus in them. Oh, well, Hillsong United isn't really making worship music anymore. Like, we just get really critical in, of them. Right. And for me, like, just to bring some balance uh, back to this conversation, it's like what we said all the way at the beginning. I really think this is a personal thing. And we obviously, the three of us, are passionate about art because mm-hmm. we're artists. 
and we care a lot about the art we consume um, being a, a true reflection of the human condition that we can analyze and we can learn from. But there's a whole lot of people out there that some maybe are even listening to this that are like, man, I don't get any of that from movies or from music yep. or from or from art, quote unquote. Like, I just want to do my work for the Lord that I feel I'm called to do and come home and occasionally like put on a movie. Right. And when I do, I don't want to be challenged. I don't want to see the horrors of life. I just want to be uplifted and, you know, I, I want to have, I want to feel good at the end of it because I get enough darkness of the world in my job or in my ministry. Right. And I totally get that. Like, to me, this is a, a personal conviction thing. And if you're uncomfortable with me even saying personal conviction thing, I would encourage you to uh, do a study on Romans chapter 14 because um, Paul has a lot to say, actually, about what can be sin yeah. or not sin based on an individual. Right. And ju just to hit the flip side, we've been promoting art and maybe trying to encourage people to not lower their walls, but just like reconsider, you know, like, well, maybe I am being a little too cautious. Like for me, I I've made the same mistake uh, by, by trying to push this on other people. So while I think it's wrong for someone to say, oh, how dare you watch this content? It's satanic. And they're like defining things for me. I think that the converse is true as well. I think it's wrong if I go like, no, 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 man, like this isn't, this isn't wrong. Just, you know, like loosen up, watch this. I've been guilty of that. And I think whichever side of the conversation you're coming from, just like Dan cited Romans 14, you have to be careful to be like, don't cause your brother the sin, but also like, don't be a Pharisee for your brother either. You know, like don't put up fences for your brother, but also don't like push your brother over the fence and kind of like be like, Oh no, it's totally cool. Because it is a personal thing. Well, I think before discussing, um, maybe some better questions that that's a good segue into the one last detour I wanted to take real quick. I also think that the converse of what you just said is true where we can take this way too far. Um, the extreme example that I hope is obvious to people, but I think it's worth saying just to be blatantly clear, would mean even though uh, sex is a part of life, that doesn't mean I think that it's totally fine to view pornography because it's just reflecting like a part of the, something that exists in our world. Like there's, there are some lines where we're saying, okay, now you're getting to a point where you are just purely reveling in entertainment from sin that has no value. And that is of no benefit to you either. Right. And I'm glad you said that. And, and I think some movies are that way too. Like we're not just talking pornography. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, there's definitely a line where it stops being a personal thing, like I said, and it becomes a sin thing. Um, but at the same time, I think there's also a, an area in which that line can be different for, for everyone. It's like, how far away from the line do you want to put your guardrail? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that that's where we have to use wisdom and discernment to say, even for like, for me personally, here's where I put my guardrail. Yeah. And that may be closer to the line than you're comfortable with, yeah. but that's, that's what I've, I've done. And we can't, I think as the church, we need to stop judging each other from where we put our guardrail, how close to the line or not, and then just start like biblically holding each other accountable when we've crossed the line. Yeah. So maybe that is a good place to begin with a better question, because I think sometimes what I see is people don't do what you just said because they take the approach of, well, you know, this whole thing about like on, only engaging with Christian labeled whatever. And, you know, all things are permissible. So it just becomes, I'm not going to make any sort of guardrail because I don't feel like I have to. And that you're not being honest about what is harmful to yourself. And that can, that can lead you down a bad road as well. Yeah. I think a good test is like, 
the fruit test. And I'm not saying that like everything you watch must produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. What I'm saying is like, if you know someone who's watching and engaging in certain media and it's like clearly changing them, like making them more mean or like way more vulgar than they're used to. Like, I think then it's worth going like, well, maybe I should, I should ask them about this. And then, and not in like a mean judging way, just be like, Hey man, like, are you like, you're like, are you good? Like make sure their own inner parameters are right. But you know, like if someone is watching something you don't think you could handle and it's not affecting them negatively at all, or I mean, maybe back off. And I, I feel like in the church, there are so many people who love to be Nathan, you know, like Nathan approaching David. Right. I think there's just like this love for that. Like, Oh, I can't wait to pull the Nathan and be like, boom, you've been doing something wrong. I think we all just need to like take a step back, be like, why do we enjoy that role so much? And it should be more of a role of humility and kind of like reluctance, not like here I go. Right. And with art, here's the beautiful thing about it. It's like, if you start watching a movie, you think, fit in the parameters that you set for yourself personally in your guardrails. And then all of a sudden there's several scenes in a row that are like, whoa, 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 this isn't for me. You can always stop watching the movie. And there's lots of things you can do. You can fast forward. You can find versions that cut out, you know, like if, if nudity of any kind is a big deal to you, you, the internet is a beautiful place. You can find a version of the movie that just vid angel is a service. If you haven't thought of it, we're not like, paid to be sponsored by VidAngel, but VidAngel is uh, a service you can use that, that censors movies, even on streaming sites. So yeah. like you can watch Netflix and have it be censored, um, which is a way to be able to um, not miss out on the social benefits of being up on certain shows mm-hmm. or just have your own like curiosity about you know how a story ends be met, but not have to engage with content you're not comfortable yeah. with. So before we transition to trying to ask a better question, I just want to kind of lay down uh, clearly why I think this, this question needs to be enhanced. So what I think is wrong with this question, can Christians consume R-rated content? One, it kind of assumes there's an objective standard, that there's one standard that we all need to adhere to, and kind of what our conversation has shown is it isn't that objective. There are personal lines. The scriptures talk about that citing Romans 14, like, you know, eating food, sacrifice to idols or, or whatnot. You know, it's a personal line and don't push someone over their line, but also don't like enforce lines in other people. So I think that's one problem. And also the, the, the question doesn't account for the nuance that is art. Art is not something you can put in a test tube. It's not something you can look at in a, in a beaker. You know, like art is very subjective and it has a lot of nuance to it and so trying to just distill it into this one there's one rule okay there's one guideline and you can't pass this and i think we need questions that account for the more personal subjective aspects to this chris do you uh do you have any questions already kind of that you've been mulling over that could be better yeah i i mean i've had a couple that have popped into my mind from our conversation. One that I love would be the idea when we come to any sort of art or media, instead of asking the question, well, is this Christian? Is this not like it based on a rating or whatever? Is it right or wrong for me to watch this or engage with this would be what truth is this communicating or what does this, what does this say about life, about humanity, about redemption? And if, I mean, if your answer is absolutely nothing, well, I don't know, maybe it's not worth engaging with, but if it does have some powerful truth to speak, that's, that's an interesting question to me. And the other interesting question to me is honestly asking yourself, like what, what sorts of things do I see that lead me personally down a path that I don't want to go down? Right. Yeah. The question I was thinking is very similar. I was thinking instead of just asking this kind of like broad 
paintbrush stroke of a question, can Christians watch R-rated content? Instead, ask, how does this content affect me? Or how do I think Mm. this content will affect me? Because then you take every piece of art at its own merit. So instead of saying, well, anything made by this person is out the window. What if it's more like just on a case by case basis or any, any kind of any type of this music I'm going to nope, not listen to. I would more encourage take everything on a case by case nature. And and instead of asking, well, can I watch R-rated content? Ask, what does this content do to me? Or how do I think this content will affect me? So if you know, there's a lot of nudity, okay, what, what would watching that do to me? Oh, I think it would lead me to think really immoral thoughts and it would kind of lead to temptation. Okay, well then don't watch it. But if um, you cited uh, that Mel Gibson movie that... Hacksaw Ridge. Hacksaw Ridge. There's a lot of gory violence in it, but you know that doesn't affect you and you're, you know there are a lot of Christian themes to it. You go, how does this affect me? Oh, okay, I think I'm good to watch it. Or even though there are Christian themes in that movie... Um, you you would say, I know how that would affect me, and I can't I can't I just can't watch the violence. Right. I I like both of those questions. I, I'm struggling to find one uh, myself to even bring to the table. Like things that are going through my mind is like, you know, we've talked about wanting questions that call us to action. So like, mm, yeah, how yeah. can I, how can I, after viewing this content, use it for a good purpose or for Christian purpose. Like how can I redeem this content after I watch it uh, is something you could ask. The other thing is like, it's similar to what you just said, Andrew is like asking yourself, why do I want to watch this content? Yeah. And I think that might unpack for yourself, like some motivations and be able to, you know, see is that a sinful motivation or not? Mm-hmm. Like for me, I just love stories. And so I think I fall into a trap of like, I want to watch almost everything that I see a trailer for. I want all the stories. Because I just get intrigued and I'm like, I want to know more. And yeah. so, but if I know that about myself, I can stop and say, why do I want to watch this? And if it's just because I don't want to, you know, have the fear of missing out, then. I know, okay, maybe I shouldn't compromise my guardrail yeah. just because I don't want to be out of a conversation because I haven't seen something. Yeah. I, lo- I love that, Dan. And I think, as we always try to highlight, that even more highlights the importance of community with all of this. Because I, I even remember um, when Dan and I were working at the same church, we were watching a show on HBO called the night of, and we would talk about it each week after we watched the next episode. And even just talking with you, Dan, things that you would pull out from your love of storytelling and symbolism that you would bring out. I was like, Oh, I didn't even catch that. That is so interesting to me. And through conversation, a lot of, redemptive truth was brought out of that show in our discussion and conversation and community, even though it wasn't necessarily created to be a Christian show. Yeah. So what if I'm going to try and combine those? Um, what if the question is, what can I get out of this? So I think that implies the whole, like, how does this affect me? But then it, it also impl- implies the like, well, what can I do with it after I watch it? You know, like, will this show bring me community, like really healthy community? Will it uh, bring really deep questions that affect me on a very human level and make me empathetic? Or will it, you know, just just hit my pleasure center and, and kind of hit my amygdala and let me drool over like blood and gore? So what do you guys think about that? What? I forgot what the question was. Uh, what can I get out of this? What do you guys think about that? I like it. Personally. I think that's a, that's a good one. And I don't know that we even just have to have one. Cause I also loved your question. How, how will this affect me? Right. Um, what is this saying and what can I get out of this? I think are almost like before, during and after questions 
with engaging any sort of art or media that are a lot better questions. And here's what I love about it, besides the fact that it came out of my mouth. (laughs) What I like about it is we're talking about we want questions that lead to action, but I also like questions that lead to thought. Mm -hmm. And so if you just have like a kind of like broad paintbrush of a rule, like I won't watch anything like this, there's really no thinking or discernment going into that. It's see that, won't watch it, see that, I'll watch it. It's almost like lazy. Yeah thinking is christian in the title i'll watch it like there's not a lot of discernment but if you ask how how does this affect me or what will i get out of this there is intentional uh conscious examination and introspection and thought that goes into it i think only good things can come out of that yeah those are very translatable um i'll even i'm even willing to call it a skill very translatable skills to have to then go out into the world and be able to look at everything happening and being able to tell, Oh, where, where is God working? Where is the truth in all of this? Where can I see Christ even amidst the broken and critically examine and ask deep questions of everything we experience? Right. Because like, and this kind of brings us full circle. Cause at the beginning we talked about, you know, does just, witnessing someone else sin cause you to sin like as you're going about your life you're walking down the street you're in an art gallery you're in a movie theater whether the art in front of you is christian or not there's people around you that probably aren't and they're walking by you dropping f-bombs or you're able to witness from across the street like maybe even some sort of abuse that then you have to report or you're seeing we're not able to completely filter our world as we're just living it. And so if you encounter art, for instance, like I said earlier, that in, you know, you didn't even necessarily want to see, you saw a billboard or a commercial or you're in an art gallery and you turn the corner and, Oh, there's something I didn't want to see. Like you can ask those questions even right in the moment to, like help guard and process what you're seeing and, yeah. and experiencing. Well, and how powerful if I can view non-Christian art or media yet see how Christ is speaking out of it still, that then I can view a non-Christian human being and see how Christ is still speaking through and out of them as well. Hey, thanks for listening to the Better Questions podcast. You can stop furiously taking notes because there was so much wisdom in that episode. Just take a little breather, take a deep breath, and just remember, like, subscribe to this podcast, and share it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Shout it from the rooftop. We don't care, just as long as we get the word out. Again, thank you so much for listening. See you next week.